Get Up Nation. My name is Ben Biddick. I am the creator and host of the Get Up Nation podcast, where I serve individuals, organizations, and societies to develop and sustain resilience and perseverance. I'm the co-author of Get Up, The Art of Perseverance with former Major League Baseball player Adam Greenberg. The Get Up Nation podcast is brought to you in partnership with GotYour6Coffee.com, where Navy veteran Eric Hadley is committed to serving first responders, veterans, and their families through a variety of nonprofit organizations. No stranger to adversity, Eric has fused the necessity of coffee with his passion for public service. You're already purchasing coffee. Why not empower your coffee with purpose? Why not purchase coffee that not only has your six, but also has the backs of those who don a uniform of service for our communities and great country. Learn more about Eric and his freshly roasted, award-winning coffee at gotyoursixcoffee.com. Recently, I had the honor and privilege of speaking with Gary McIntosh. Gary is an experienced growth and administrative executive. Uh, prior to joining Operation Underground Railroad, Gary served as Chief Operating Officer for Antiva Health, where he was charged with financial planning, investor relations, healthcare administration, strategic partnerships, sales and marketing, and general operations. Gary has over eight years managing healthcare and software teams and holds a high importance on cultivating integrity and positivity in the workplace. Today, he's serving others at Operation Underground Railroad, which exists to rescue children from sex trafficking. This tremendous organization is doing amazing work. As a prior human trafficking investigator, I can't say enough about the impact this organization is making on this earth. Uh, Since being founded in December 2013, OUR has gathered the world's experts in extraction operations and in anti-child trafficking efforts to bring an end to child slavery. OUR's ops team consists of former CIA, past and current law enforcement, and highly skilled operatives that lead coordinated identification and extraction efforts. These operations are always in conjunction with law enforcement throughout the world. Uh, Check out the OUR website, OURrescue.org. It's written there that once victims are rescued, a comprehensive process involves justice for the perpetrators and recovery and rehabilitation for the survivors. Uh, And that begins. And it's time for private citizens and organizations to rise up and help. It is our duty as free and blessed people to do that. I am honored and blessed today to be joined by Gary McIntosh of Operation Underground Railroad. Gary, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, man. Thanks to you and your team, Ben. Uh, Really excited to be here and and discuss a little bit about what we do this morning. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Gary, where are you currently located? Well, I'm in in Park City and I got here by way of Texas. I I spent the last uh, about 10 years of my career in Austin, Texas, Central Texas there. And uh, as soon as I had the opportunity to join up with Operation Underground Railroad, uh, shipped up here to Park City, Utah, and that's where we've been uh, holed up for the last 45 days or so. Wow. Um, Okay, so you spent some time in the medical field and now you're working at OUR. Will you share what led to this transition? Yeah, uh, it's, um, you know, uh, there's there's some intricacies to that story, but Uh, More or less, um, I'll just say that uh, I really love my career in healthcare. I love what I was doing with that company, Um, but call it what you will, you know, a higher calling, a a more fulfilling purpose, Um, you know, the opportunity. I've been following OUR for a couple years now, and uh, I first got introduced to the organization uh, watching a documentary on Amazon Prime called Operation Toussaint. Um, it's free if you have prime. I really act. In fact, I'm not even encouraging. I just implore anyone who has uh, a night to themselves to, to take a look at that, put the kids to bed. And, um, it's very enlightening and, and it even tells a little bit of the story of, of OUR. But anyway, I got exposed to that documentary kind of fell on it. Honestly, I, I wouldn't consider myself as a, you know, a social activist or somebody who's been, you know, intimately involved over the years in, in this subject. Uh, recently, the opportunity uh, came forth that they were looking for somebody to assist in their in their development department. Um, so my my responsibilities are a little bit of awareness, uh, a little bit of fundraising, and my wife and I, you know, we sat down, we talked about it, and we decided, you know, let's take this this leap, let's take this next step, um, and, uh, and and go for it. So here we are. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. Um, so th- people have a lot of misconceptions about about this topic, about human trafficking, about sex slavery, about where it happens and how it happens. Will you give a basic, basic breakdown um, of, of, of what we're dealing with here and help people understand the significance of it? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, 
all these estimations are different because this is a crime and obviously not all crimes are reported until they're you know, the perpetrators caught or what have you. Uh, but, you know, most experts, you know, you have Polaris out there, some other federal organizations that kind of take stock of, of what's going on around the world. Uh, there's estimated, um, you know, 40 million uh, people around the world in, in slavery and 10 million of those are estimated to be children. And specifically, OUR's focused are the two million children around the world that are stuck, in my opinion, in the darkest corner of humanity, uh, which is sex slavery. And as long as those two million children, I wish my job didn't exist, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, but as long as those two million children are, 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 are you know, caught in the bondage of slavery, our, our organization is going to continue to fight the fight. Most people are surprised to, to learn that 30 to 40 percent of the operations that we run are actually right here in the U.S. So, um, you know, we deal a lot with child predators online, um, which is a hot topic right now. I'm thankful that this is starting to get talked about and people are starting to gain more understanding about this. But the reality is, is that there are more slaves in the world today than there ever have been in the history of the world. Uh, and the fight is, is needed now more, more than it ever has been. I mean, we, we like to say in the U S that we eradicated slavery. Um, and the reality is, is that we haven't. And uh, you know, these kids are, are literally living hell on earth. And, and I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit more in this discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So, so a lot of people don't realize that it's happening in our backyard um, and it's happening and it wouldn't exist without the demand, which is a, another concern, but basically, yeah, I want to just speak to uh, what is a, a common path of exploitation for a young person uh, that, that you regularly see? Could you give some, I'm sure there, there's a number of different ways, but will you give an example of a common way that young people are trapped in slavery? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, honestly, Ben, I, I, I try even not to get as deep as, as I could in some of these conversations. I mean, you know, firsthand yeah. really how heinous this is. And, um, you know, uh, probably the, the, the most alarming thing I might say in this discussion, I'll, I'll say now, um, just to give perspective, I mean, it, it's the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world. It's a $150 billion industry. And people often ask, you know, what, why is it so, prevalent. Why does it exist? And, and you said it, it's, it's the demand, right? U S has the highest demand of child pornography out of any country in the world. Um, and so in, in many ways we're the demand. Um, so, you know, you can sell a bag of cocaine once, but you can sell a child five, 10 times a day for however many years. And, um, that it's, it, it's, it's, it's awful to think about it. It's horrific to think about, um, but the reality is, is that the, you know, these children are, are, are experiencing that they're experiencing maybe five, 10 times a day, um, you know, being exploited in that way. So about 85% of all trafficking situations actually start online. Um, and you know, it, it's, it's really anyone, I mean, definitely, uh, at risk youth. Uh, I saw some statistic recently. This is, this is new information that uh, within 48 hours of a teen leaving their home, about a third of them are already approached and, and uh, you know, solicited for sex. I mean, it, it's, just, it's just unreal. So these predators are crafty, they're manipulative, they go through a process called grooming, and particularly online, they have a way of, you know, um, targeting individuals who maybe they just went through a breakup, um, you know, maybe their home life is, is rough, um, you know, they don't have a lot of strong emotional or, or even physical support in, in their in their family unit. And so um, these guys are uh, guys and gals are, are experts at, at just grooming these kids and, and getting them trapped into situations. So they, they isolate them from their family and their friends. Um, they do a thing where typically uh, they might give them gifts or just kind of shower them with money and that sort of thing initially um, just to get them, you know, roped in. And then, uh, you know, event, all of a sudden, you know, they're asking them, hey, you know, would you do this thing with, with a friend of mine, uh, that kind of thing. And, and all of a sudden they're exploiting them and, and making money off of them, um, you know, and, and we've all been teenagers and, 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 and particularly, actually, this is crazy. The average kid in this situation is 13, 13 years old, 12 to 14. That's the average. And so uh, a 12 year old doesn't, doesn't know 
yeah. um, you know, all the ways that, that somebody might be manipulated. They're just too naive. They haven't had that, that life experience. And so that's also why, why they're, why they're targets for these guys. So uh, th there's many ways, obviously technologies these days is a huge component of that. And we really take an effort to, uh, to build systems and infrastructure to, to locate where these things are happening online. We put on sting operations and, and trap these guys trying to, trying to uh, promote, promote kids for sex. So um, there's a lot of ways that we do that, but, but that's, you know, that's, that's your typical path these days. I see. And then as people are um, practicing social, iso social isolate, isolation during COVID-19, what are some of the specifics you're seeing as far as, you know, the tactics that are being used? Uh, any, any insight into what's happening or how this process is changing due to COVID, due to everybody being online? Um, what are your insights tactically currently? Yeah. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, numbers have risen. Um, there's some preliminary statistics on that. Unfortunately, uh, you know, stats and info is usually well behind the crime, right? So um, sometimes we're two or three steps behind, behind these guys. But really what I just encourage everyone to do, I have very young kids. I try not to even think about that. I, I don't think I have the mental, mental capacity for that. But, um, you know, as my kids get older, I just always want to know what they're doing online. There's so many apps now that aren't even what they look like, you know, or aren't even what they say that they are. They're, they're private messaging apps and things like that. So uh, there's lots of ways for these guys to, to infiltrate Snapchat, you know, Messenger, just to name a few. There's nothing wrong with those, um, those social media platforms per se, uh, but you always, as a parent, just not a helicopter parent, but you just want to know, you know, you want to foster those conversations and have transparency there. But absolutely. And, you know, one of the unfortunate, uh, an additional unfortunate, I should say, outcome of, of this quarantine is that there's so much more uh, time and traffic online. And, uh, and it's certainly a concern of ours. And you touched on this before, you know, when we, we talk about this as a crime, it's certainly it's children. Um, you know, being used to commercial sexual activity, no child should ever have to experience that. Um, and it's a crime, but it's a crime that's not like many other crimes. It is the amount of coercion and manipulation that goes into a predator grooming and, and seasoning these young people is profound. So it's not like, you know, uh, law enforcement can say, um, you know, did you steal this TV out of someone's house? I, and, and there's a clear, a clear victim who says, yes, I want this enforced because I want my TV that this guy stole from me. It's a different situation when it comes to prosecution, when it comes to meeting the needs and supporting survivors of this. Uh, will you go into a little bit of the complexity of, of this type of crime and how it takes a, a team of people to truly be successful in stopping, uh, in stopping this? Yeah, that's a that's a really insightful question, Ben. Um, you know, basically, our you know that's really our bread and butter, right? Is that we 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 obviously want to liberate the children, but we definitely want to do it in a way that we gather evidence along that process and make sure that we we can hand over evidence, and I'll I'll explain that in a minute to uh, local governments and local law enforcement, so that they can go through the process of actually prosecuting and arresting. Uh, and, and putting behind bars the, the predators and, and the traffickers. So, you know, when, when we got when we were founded, uh, we were founded by Tim Ballard. He's a, a, a former U.S. Department of Homeland Security operative. He, he did that work for about 12 years. And he started on the southern border of California. And he was really involved in breaking up drug trafficking rings and, and working with the cartel. I mean, he was like literally in the tunnels and things like that. And, uh, you know, only just a few months into that role, he was actually brought in by his boss and um, asked if he wanted to start up an Internet Crimes Against Children task force. Um, and nobody was really doing it in those days. And, um, you know, he uh, he went through the process, the, the, the gut wrenching process of, of learning about what was happening and um, having to go through evidence and, and, and videos of, of these children being exploited. And, uh, you know, he, he broke up dozens of, of trafficking rings while he was, he was under, under the department. But the issue was, is that, um, you know, we have jurisdictional laws in place here in the U.S. And they're, they're good laws. I mean, we can't, we can't be everything for everyone. We can't go solve crimes around the world. Um, but particularly with this issue, it's so challenging because you have so many jurisdictions involved sometimes. You have people trafficked out of the U.S. You have people trafficked into the U.S. And, and where does the jurisdiction lie? 
And so um, he came across a couple of cases that, that, are, uh, that are pretty known if you, if you know OUR story by this point. Um, so I'll just, I'll kind of glaze over those, but feel free to, um, you know, look on our website and, and watch that documentary and, and definitely fill in the details. But basically, Tim would find out that these children were being harmed and they were being hurt. Um, but he, he couldn't really step in and do anything about it. He knew where the kids were. The kids were easy to find. Um, you know, in, in fact, be on a, a beach for, for 10 minutes in Cartagena and somebody would approach you um, and, you know, you just ask them, well, you know, how young are they? And, and all of a sudden within 30 minute conversation, um, you know, children are being solicited for sex. So um, that, that's, that's the approach that we take as operators. We're always invited into countries. We're uh, currently in 24 countries and we work with 25 states, uh, different counties and, and law enforcement within those states. And we're invited into those, um, those situations to consult, uh, uh, to act as informants, and, and ultimately to go undercover. And so our guys are putting cameras on themselves. Um, you know, they have audio. They're gathering evidence and uh, trying to catch these perpetrators in a transaction where they're actually selling the child. And at that moment, that's when our teams, the local law enforcement, rush in and make the arrest because we can't make arrests, right? We don't have the jurisdiction to do that. So uh, we set up these operations with local law enforcement. That's when they rush in. We get the kids out. We put them in aftercare. And, um, and ultimately, we arrest the traffickers. And then, and then the process really begins, right? As a former law enforcement individual you, or task force, you, you, know, you know this process is, is long and arduous sometimes. Um, but the, you know, the good thing is, is that we got the kids separated from, from the, the, those monsters and, um, and now we're on the process of delivering any evidence that we've got added along the way to actually prosecute them and put the behind bars. Amazing. Will you, will you share a little bit about that, that process? So you get the children out and obviously they've survived horrific realities mm -hmm. um, and have, you know, deep, deep needs um, to, to deal with the exploit, the results of the exploitation. What is some of the support uh, that's done? What is some of the aftercare? How do you help these children? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So, um, you know, sometimes contrary to popular belief, we actually won't rescue a child until we know that we have a safe bed uh, and resources available for them for their healing journey. You know, there's stats out there that uh, some 80% of anyone who is put in a traffic situation or sexual exploitation situation, if they don't have um, some, some, you know, financial or educational stream to cling to, uh, then they're actually going to end up back, back in that world. Cause it's, it's what they know. Um, Stockholm syndrome is, is very real and it's very real for, for these victims as well. Uh, so, you know, the first thing we do when we enter a new location is we vet out these aftercare centers. Uh, it's a public private partnership. So, um, we like to work with private organizations cause there's a little bit less red tape, but we also work with public organizations and they're, they're cultural, they're local, um, and we have an amazing aftercare team that is like literally, you know, except for the last few weeks, you know, they're literally traveling half the year, visiting children, visiting all the aftercare centers that we partner with around the world uh, to make sure that these kids have what they need. So um, we're, it's very important to us as an organization. A lot of people that know us know us because of our rescue missions. Mm -hmm. um, but we have uh, just as much, if not more of an emphasis on, on aftercare because you said it. I mean, um, you know, anyone who, who has been anywhere near this environment knows how heinous these crimes are. Um, they're, you know, just total lack of, of human right and, and human liberty. Uh, and it, it's, it's literally hell on earth. As I said before, it's, it's just, it's just the darkest thing to imagine. And then particularly a child in that situation. So um, we, you know, we've even started funding uh, trade school opportunities, educational opportunities. So um, basically what we're doing is we're just asking these kids, you know, what, what, what do you dream about? What do you, what, what do you want to do with your life? What do you want to become? Um, we have some, some great stories. I'll, I'll tell you one, one quick one, just for the sake of time. Um, an individual who was on one of our initial uh, rescue missions uh, is now uh, an adult and uh he wanted to learn to uh, cut hair. And so we funded for him to go to beauty school. Um, and we even, uh, it was great. We have this great uh, video of Tim 
getting his hair cut by, by this individual. Uh, and, and this guy's great to talk about resilience. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just hard to even imagine, but now he's actually helping kids in his community, in his area, because he knows what trafficking looks like. He knows what it is, you know, for those kids to fall into that. And so uh, he's out there, you know, just, just educating them and being proactive about it so that they don't have to live the life that, that he lived. Uh, and so we're, we're really proud of him and he's really, you know, um, felt empowered through that aftercare process. He was hungry for knowledge to, to learn anything he could. So, you know, we're doing, uh, we're doing technical scholarships to, to learn coding. Uh, we're doing uh, trades, trades skills, as, as I mentioned before. So a lot of opportunities out there. And um, if anyone's interested in, in sort of the educational component or the, um, the professional component of, of our, of our services, uh, you know, just encourage you to reach out to me. I'd be happy to talk more about that um, and talk about how you might be able to get involved in, in helping these kids uh, jumpstart their career. Amazing. I love that. Uh, yeah, that just fires me up when we talk about resilience. You know, it's, it's, some, it's, it's people experiencing this adversity. And I don't, I, <laughs> somebody who is a survivor of this, like I don't even call that adversity. I call that as like an all out insidious you know attempt mm -hmm. to basically destroy them uh mm -hmm. so that's adversity is too small a word but um but to see these resilient survivors i mean i remember sitting in er in er exam rooms uh you know mm -hmm. county jail uh you know uh visitor uh, the visiting section of county jails just listening to these people and it is truly remarkable uh, that you start to quickly realize that it is truly a miracle that they're in front of you breathing after all mm. that they've been through, the the impact on their mental health, dealing with trying to cope with the trauma that they've experienced by by use, using substances or being mm -hmm. fed substances by their uh, by these predators or or by the people that are trying to manipulate and coerce them, you know, and the suicide attempts, the the uh, tremendous tremendous people uh, exhibit some of the most profound resilience I've ever heard. Uh, during those late night talks in ERs when they've had their jaw, hit, you know, when their face is full of blood and swollen from being beaten, when, um, you know, they're just, uh, I, I just, it's, it's horrendous. And so, so when we get to the point of, of seeing them thrive like that, that is so invigorating and it's inspiring. It gives, it gives me chills to know that, that you guys and this organization and so many, you know, noble people are catching on to the fact that this is a reality. You know, I, I, we, we talk about just one sexual assault, how devastating that can be. Just one, mm -hmm. let alone years of repeated assault over time. Like um, these people are, you know, superheroes to, to just be standing there in front of us and to see them get to do their trade, to, to, to lock into their dreams and talents because of what you guys are doing. Tell me how proud uh, that makes you though. What moments of like gratitude that are you guys overwhelmed with as you see these young people go from what they were in and you've seen it into a, an existence where they're thriving, where they're sharing, where they're empowering, where they're growing. What is that process like for you and your team? Yeah. So, um, there's a, a couple groups of individuals that I just really want to highlight. I mean, you and I have been, we have the chance to sit down and, and talk about this, but there's so many faceless and nameless heroes. Yeah. Um, you know, our, our operators are, are one of those groups. I mean, you know, the things that these guys witness and, and experience and, 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 and I think even more than that, psychologically, they actually, because they're going undercover, they have to act like, those monsters that would want to harm and hurt kids, you know, that's that. And they have to, they have to kind of go in and out of that identity. Yeah. Um, and they have to, uh, you know, smile in the face of evil and, and laugh and joke about this, this horrible, heinous thing in order to get in a situation where they can save those kids. So that's, you know, that's the reality. That's what they sign up for. That's what they volunteer for. Um, and uh, it, it's just amazing. And then, I, you know, I get to come here and, and talk about it. And, and, and really, they're, you know, they're the heroes. Um, but, you know, for, for confidentiality reasons, obviously, they, they, and, and even most of them don't even want to, right? I mean, they, that, that's, just, that's just how good of people they are. Right, right. Um, and then secondly, you mentioned it, the, the survivors. Um, and it's incredibly incredibly invigorating to uh, to see them thrive and, and to see them have breakthroughs and, and overcome challenges and um, you know many of them for uh, that have, have been in that situation you know even even for months um, are you know are on a, a lifelong journey 
yeah. to, to heal from that. And so, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that we get them in front of professionals. And, and as I mentioned before, that they have the resources they need to, to, to really heal and, and grow. But, um, you know, we have, we have stories where we're jumping our, up and down as an office. We had a, a child recently um, who was in a situation where um, he was hurt by his trafficker in a way where he, he, he lost the ability to walk. Um, and I don't know all the, all the medical reasons for that, but we, we flew him here to Utah and some amazing surgeons here in Utah uh, provided some pro bono work for him. And I just saw a video yesterday of him uh, on, a, on a scooter um, just, you know, trying to rehabilitate and, and, and start moving and that sort of thing. So um, you definitely get those situations where it makes it all worth it. Right. It just it just makes those um, long weeks and, and, you know, long months of, of being a, on a case, uh, getting to the end of it and knowing that you're you're doing something life changing for, for these kids, um, you know, just getting them out of a situation that's that's impossible for them to thrive. Right. And, and be healthy and then putting them in a situation where it is viable for them to thrive and, and be healthy. So, yeah, that's great. Um, what, the, one question I also had is how do you handle the self-care of your, of the people in the organization? Because obviously, you know, we can talk about generalizations. We can talk about, you know, pretty heinous things. We can talk about, uh, you know, seasonings and, and groomings and then assaults and then physical violence and uh, coercion with substances. We can talk about all of these things and that, and we can talk about it, but those men and women who go in and actually see those sites, smell those smells, hear the cries for help, hear those, have those, those experiences. Um, you know, what do you do to take care of each other uh, because of such an overwhelming and, you know, disturbing reality? How do you help each other stay resilient through it all? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and um, you know, I, I alluded to earlier, Tim, knowing where these kids are and, and not being able to, to move forward. I mean, that, that was what got our nonprofit started, right? I mean, he, he learned of particularly two groups of children that he, um, he could do something about, but he, he wasn't going to be able to have the support of, 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 of his, uh, his supervisors and, and the U.S. government. So um, that's when he decided he was actually going to leave um, his pension, his salary, his benefits uh, to take this leap of faith. He raised enough money. Uh, from a private donor to run these two missions. So there was no sustainability plan beyond yeah. that, uh, which I, I wouldn't recommend, but he just, he was so hungry, um, you know, just to start really making, making more of a difference uh, in, in other countries where he knew that these things were happening. So uh, the missions were incredibly successful. Uh, we, we rescued over 120 kids on those first two missions. And, you know, today we've, uh, we rescued over 3,600 survivors and we're just about to cross the 2000 threshold for traffickers and predators arrested. So um, we're just, just a handful of, of cases away from, from making that happen, which is a big milestone for us as an organization. But more to your point, um, you know, I think it helps us as an organization that we've had such amazing operational and law enforcement leadership. Our director of operations had over 25 years of, of law enforcement. And so those resources that are available, uh, you know, we do everything we can to make sure that our operators have access to those resources as well. Uh, you know, obviously debriefing, counsel, grief counseling, things like that, just to help them process what they're seeing and what they're doing and remain effective. Um, but I think more than that, you know, these guys are just, they're, they're just, they're, you know, steel hearted, steel faced. I mean, they, they just, they know what they're doing. They, they know why they're doing it. Um, and uh, they have the amazing ability to just handle the, you know, the stress of it all. Um, but it, it, you know, it gets the best of us. I mean, Tim will tell you that there's situations where he just couldn't help, you know, seeing his own kids in that situation, even when he was on a mission, which is not the thing you want to be, you want to do when you're undercover, you know, you want to remain in character. Um, it's just so challenging sometimes. And he, he, he would describe coming home and literally just falling on the floor, like literally collapsing because of just the weight of, of what, you know, what he's experiencing. So um, we definitely encourage that with our operators and, and we provide them with any, any kind of care that, that they need to, to keep moving forward and, and stay healthy. Amazing. Um, yeah. Let's see. Will you will you tell some of the accomplishments of your organization? Some of the things you're very proud of. Can you run through a few? Yeah, 
Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, we, we have a, 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 what we call a small army of volunteers. We have over 12,000 volunteers, uh, which, is, which, is, which is amazing. I mean, so many people wanting to jump in and join the fight. Um, and, you know, I just want to encourage anyone listening, if, if, if you are feeling, um, you know, that fire that, that I, you know, I hear other people describe when they, you know, first kind of get turned on and, and the light bulbs come on and they're like, oh my gosh, you know, what, what can I do about this situation? I would just, there's a couple of things. Um, go to our site. We have uh, know the signs of trafficking. So it's actually a training that you can go through and, and get a certificate from, uh, you know, provided by OUR. Uh, you'll interact with, with some of our leadership here who've had experience in the industry and, and can, um, you know, talk expertly about, about what, what to see and what to notice and what to do about it. Um, and then, and then I would encourage everyone to, to join the fight. There's a join the fight tab on our website and there's a couple other, um, you know, opportunities to get involved, whether it's, you know, starting your own fundraiser, you know, promoting a 5k, uh, we, we have high school students that put on fundraisers at their school, which, which is amazing. So lots of different ways to get there, to get involved. We also have what we call our abolitionist club. And this is another thing that we're really proud of. So, um, our abs club, which is individuals who are giving recurring donations, you know, $2 a month, all the way up to thousands of dollars a month, just, you know, whatever that person's capacity is. Uh, we have, um, you know, over 10,000 abs club members. And, uh, this is, I love this statistic so much because it, it just, it just demonstrates that anyone can really get involved and, and really make a difference. Uh, the abs clubs donations actually support 30 to 40% of our mission. So, uh, we're really proud of that club. Um, and we're, we're really thankful for all those generous people that are just, you know, I just, that say, maybe I don't have law enforcement training. Maybe I don't have military training, but this is a way I can get involved and, and really, really change um, a child's life. Amazing. Yeah. People need to go to uh, the links below. We're going to set up all the links so that you can uh, uh, jump right on board, uh, get involved with this team, you know, use uh, your resources to help support uh, Gary's and his team's amazing work here with Tim Ballard and um, really, really a profound opportunity to know what, you know, we spend our money on various things, but to spend your money on that, if it's even $2 a month, that's maybe two dollars of the most uh, powerful money that you're spending that that month is to know that that money those even if it's two dollars it's ten dollars if it's you know a hundred dollars a month that work is going to saving the lives of these kids and and uh, and and talk about resilience and and dealing with challenges and overcoming things this is these are some of the finest human beings you've ever met who are doing this who are putting themselves in harm's way to basically save the voiceless, to save the people who are hidden in plain sight, to bring them uh, back from a place of being treated as if they have no value whatsoever, uh, other than, be, other than uh, being a, a commodity, and bringing them back to a place where they feel a sense of value, where they're treated as, as little and precious uh, lives. So I would encourage anybody and everybody to uh, support this organization. Look at the links below. See how you can help. Uh, I can guarantee you there'll be more from Get Up Nation who are um, who are interested in helping in any way, uh, Gary, with your organization. We're getting kind of to the end here. Maybe we could do more shows here in the future to highlight uh, different things that are happening at OUR. Uh, but right now, I always end the show with six quick questions to help my listeners understand the why within my phenomenal guests. Will you run through these six quick questions with me? Sure. All right. Uh, who are you thankful for today? Oh man, I'm so thankful for my family. Uh, I have I have three young kids, as I said earlier, under five, uh, and an amazing wife. Who uh, I mean, we you know we we left a uh, I'll say um, you know stable kind of comfortable situation. Not that we're uncomfortable now by any means, but it was a big change for our family. And, um, you know, I'm just so grateful for them, uh, you know, just participating and, and coming on this journey alongside me. And now that we've covered who you're thankful for today, what are you thankful for today? I'm thankful for, um, I'm thankful that we have men and women around the world who are sacrificing the comfort of their homes and in some some ways, maybe their own safety, uh, their mental health, to do whatever it takes to get children out of slavery. 
And how do you fuel the fire within you? These are good questions, Ben. <laughs> uh, man, I, I am, um, I'm, I'm motivated by uh, other people who have, have set the example, set the example for ambition, set the example for, for dreaming big and going after things that you, that you believe in. Um, and that fuels me, that, that keeps me motivated. Um, again, I have to turn back to my family, um, you know, just, just being around them, you know, seeing them grow and, and, and learn and, and learn new things. Uh, anyone, you know, who's had young kids just knows how exciting that is. Uh, and that certainly motivates me as well. I would say, you know, I haven't always been the most ambition or ambitious or, or motivated person, but, uh, once I had kids that, that really lit a fire for me. Um, and it, it keeps me going. It keeps me going through, maybe hard days at the office, uh, hard stories or cases that we're working through as a company. Um, you know, I just, I just try to cling to those things to keep me moving forward. That's excellent. What are you, what is one thing adversity taught you to value? Yeah. So, um, I think that, uh, you know, somebody, somebody, um, I've been mentored by in my life, um, who I have a lot of respect for, um, says that you'll never have as much, um, joy as you've had sorrow in your life. And I think, I think when you go through challenging things, when you go through adversity, it actually um, allows you to cling to joy in your life. Like you really, you really know how to value um, the good things that, that are happening around you um, and, and experience true, uh, genuine joy. And what are you doing today? You may have never thought you could. Yeah, I think uh, I think this role is is a great testament to that. Um, you know, we're a pr we're a pretty small organization. There's there's less than thirty of us uh, administratively speaking, and then we have operators that we work with, obviously around the world. Um, but uh, this role is a, is a dream come true to me. You know, I, I was uh, I was on a, a really a different career path in, in healthcare software uh, and, and healthcare practice management, and uh, it, you know I like everyone else, I mean, I was just thinking to myself, you know, what, what can I do? I mean, we actually started, um, this is maybe a longer answer than you were hoping for, but, nice. uh, when we first learned about OUR, I mean, we just, we just, we had to do something, right. We took our kids and we did these lemonade stands and these hot chocolate stands in our, in our neighborhood, uh, just, just to, you know, have conversations about it, to make people aware of it. Uh, and, you know, raise a little money that we were able to, to, I mean, a little money that we were able to shell over to OUR as well. And just to be doing that in more of an official capacity, I think is a, is a dream come to it's, it's almost like that path was, you know, just sort of laid out for us. Amazing. And then what will you do tomorrow that you may have never thought you could? Um, it's a good question, man. Um, I'm just going to keep on this fight. I'm going to keep on this journey. I feel like it's a, it's an opportunity, uh, you know, to be a part of this team um, is uh, is a unique opportunity, and I'm I'm incredibly grateful for it. And so I'm just going to keep putting one foot in front of the other day after day, and do everything I can to uh, help our operators rescue these kids and and help our kids get the aftercare that they need. Amazing. How can people learn more about you and your amazing work? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the, it's mentioned a couple times. The links will be down there, um, you know, below below the show and the show notes. Um, feel free to to reach out to us info at ourrescue.org if you have any questions. Um, another thing I want to mention is that we we do partner with a lot of corporations as well for events and and fundraising. Uh, you can reach us at partnerships at ourrescue.org. And so that's a couple of ways that you can get a hold of us. Uh, please do, you know, I, I, I love meeting new people. I love learning their stories. And the most amazing thing to me is, you know, uh, having an awareness conversation about what we're doing and then see people light up and take ownership of that. Right. And just, just say, you know, um, again, I don't have military background. I don't have law enforcement background, but you know, I'm going to use my influence. I'm going to use my network to help spread the word and, and make a difference. That that's what really, really gets me going as well.